Yes, it is. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin. I'm the events coordinator at Square Books in Oxford, Mississippi. Um, we are gathered here today <laughs> to celebrate the publication of Miranda Beverly Whittemore's Fierce Little Thing. Um, and we're going to be kind of talking about it through the lens of writing female power. We've got some wonderful women joined um, gathered today. Uh, but before I kind of hand it off to them, I wanted to do a little bit of Square Books housekeeping, tell you about some other upcoming events, then I'll get out of the way and we can get this started. So um, Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Central Time, we have partnered with our friends from Lemuria Books in Jackson, Mississippi to present Jennifer Lapidus in conversation with Robert Raymond. He's a baker at Sunflower Oven Co-op Bakery in Jackson for uh, Jennifer's book, Southern Ground, Reclaiming Flavor Through Stone Milled Flour. So if you've developed a bread baking habit over the last year or so, I think this event would be for you. And then on Tuesday, August 3rd at 5.30 Central Time, um, I hope you'll help us welcome Omar el who's the author of Square Book's bestseller, American War, and Elena Passarello for a conversation and celebration of Omar's beautifully written, unrelentingly dramatic, and profoundly moving new novel, What Strange Paradise, a story that looks at the global refugee crisis through the eyes of a child. Um, so a little more about the the women on your Zoom screen today. Miranda Beverly Whittemore is the New York Times bestselling author of Bittersweet, June, Set Me Free, The Effects of Light, and of course, Fierce Little Thing. A recipient of the Crazy Horse Prize in Fiction, she lives and writes in Brooklyn. Uh, Marcy Dermansky is the author of the critically acclaimed novels, Very Nice, The Red Car, Bad Marie, and Twins. She has received fellowships from the McDowell Colony and the Edward, Edward F. Albee Foundation. She lives with her daughter in Montclair, New Jersey. Leslie Jameson is the author of the New York Times bestsellers, The Recovering in the Empathy Exams, and the novel, The Gin Closet. She is a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine, and her work has appeared in publications including The Atlantic, Harper's, The New York Times Book Review, The Oxford American, and The Virginia Quarterly Review. She directs the graduate nonfiction program at Columbia University and lives in Brooklyn with her family. Last but certainly not least, uh, Emily Rabito's um, books are The Professor's Daughter, Searching for Zion, and Caution, Lessons in Survival, forthcoming from Holt. She lives in the Bronx and teaches creative writing at CUNY. Um, all right, phew, enough from me. Uh, I'm gonna pass it on to y'all, those of y'all who are uh, in attendance, please submit questions in the Q&A function. I'll come back later and um, moderate those. But in the meantime, um, thank you all for sharing your evening with us. And I'm so excited to eavesdrop on this conversation. All right, thanks ladies. Well, thanks Caitlin and Square Books. Um, I just wanted to say hi to everyone. I'm so glad you all are here. I'm so glad my favorite, favorite panelists are here to talk with me, all wonderful friends of mine. Um, and I wanted to just encourage people, you know, it's really lonely and weird not to be doing this in person. So in the chat function, please feel free to chat with me and with each other and with my panelists. It should feel like we're at a bookstore together, the best we can possibly make that happen. So, you know, don't, don't hold back. Don't be shy, ask questions. Um, and uh, I wanted, I kind of had this idea, this book is about a commune, <laughs> people who live together in a commune. And I, and I, love eating with my friends and um this time has been really weird that that has gone away so i wanted to also all imagine just for a minute in like a woo woo way like they would in this book that we're all sitting around a table and we're like cutting sourdough bread together and we're eating maybe like some really like the best version of lentil soup um which when it's really good is really good is what these people would eat and like maybe we're like eating a zucchini or something that's been grown um, and we're just enjoying each other's company. And that's the vibe I want from this. So feel free to like ask and be involved in that way as we would um, if we were sitting around the table. Um, I also just wanna thank all of you for coming who are here and to my publisher. It's so weird not to like be able to hug my publicist and my editor tonight. So, and my marketing person and so, and my agent and I send you all love. I am so grateful to all of you for what you've done to help me. Um, so 
Uh, Fierce Little Things about a lot of things. Um, and when I thought about writing this, what, what I was gonna do to celebrate this book coming out, there were many different themes I could have gone with. I could have gone with the the bread baking theme, like that, what what, what Caitlin just said about the, the person who's talking about flour, milled flour, that would work. So I could have talked to some bakers. Um, I could talk about motherhood and the idea of a mother and sourdough starter, which maybe we'll get into if we talk about that in this conversation. Um, but it could talk about, we could talk about cults, we could talk about friendship. But one of the things that I think is kind of latent in this book is the idea of female power and how it, how it, how it works, how it kind of flies under the radar in patriarchy. <laughs> um, and in many ways, this book is a thriller. It's about a group of friends who, when they're children, um, do something really terrible in a last ditch attempt to save the only home they've ever loved, which is a cult. Um, and then it's about when, them when they're adults uh, and the past comes back to reckon with them and they're basically, they're blackmailed to go back to the place where they started um, to have to confront what they've done. Um, so what's interesting to me in terms of this panel is that that cult is run by a man named Abraham who's very charismatic and very powerful. And um, I wanted to imbue him with these like really deeply charismatic aspects. Um, but there are all of these women who are underneath him, who are actually incredibly powerful, including Saskia, the main character, who ends up rising up against him um, finally at the end in a, in, a, in a very satisfying vengeance that, I, that really helped me get through this very difficult time of toxic masculinity. So that's why I thought that this would be a really interesting conversation because these three women who are here with me tonight have thought a lot about that idea, are very powerful women in their own right, but also write about female power in ways that I find really interesting. And so I just wanted to welcome them and start up the conversation um, and just kind of ask them about how they see their work fitting in with this idea, if they wanna start. And anyone can go. Marcy, do you wanna talk first? Oh gosh. Alphabetically. <laughs> <laughs> or Leslie or Emily. Or you could also talk about what you see in each other's work. I mean, because one of the things that I love in yeah. Bad Marie, yeah. Marcy's book, Bad Marie, is like, I, I, I mean, Bad Marie is such a fantastic book because it's so, she's so bad. And that is so powerful, her badness. Yeah. It's funny because I, I think with Bad Marie, it sort of started for me in a way, the conversation that's been just spreading for years now about the unsympathetic female character and how we're supposed to like our female narrators. And that, that never even occurred to me to, to worry about when I was writing, like would people like or not like Marie? And I guess she's a sociopath and she steals a child. But when I wrote that book, I just loved her. I think that's how I write it. I love all of my characters. And so, but it was, it, it's always been interesting to me that people always worry when women write, not when men write, but when women write, do we like her? Do we like the protagonist? And that, that sort of matters like when people buy a book and I find that kind of shocking and interesting and, and that conversation still continues. But I feel like the more unlikable a character is, sometimes the more we're gonna end up liking them and caring about them, the, the more trouble they get into. Yeah. yeah. Emily. Uh <laughs> You just made me think, um, Marcy, about uh, Saskia, but about about um, Miranda's main character. I I'm, I have the privilege of being Miranda's writing partner for many years. I wanted to just say congratulations on your pub day, Miranda. Mm -hmm. um, it's really exciting to see this book coming out, especially after such a tough year. I know that Miranda was writing this under really difficult circumstances. All of us were writing under difficult circumstances but it's amazing that you pulled this off and I'm very happy for you. But I just wanted to share as Miranda's writing partner that I've seen this book like from the inklings of her imagination about what it, what it might be like through to the end. And um, as it was developing, this woman who became the main character was really, and remains one of um, several integral characters. But to me as a reader, she was so troubled and so interesting. She has an eating disorder. She's a hermit. Um, we see her, in, as we see all the characters in two different stages of their development, both as a teenager and then as a middle-aged woman. And as a middle-aged woman, she's really screwed up, but so fascinating. So when Miranda and others mentioned bread and sourdough starter, like really her most beloved 
companion is her like sourdough starter that she that she nurtures this sourdough and she lives alone and she has like a housekeeper who comes but she's really troubled and I remember saying to Miranda um you know she's just my favorite character <laughs> she's and that, that's not because I like her it's just she's so odd and I really I just um while respecting Miranda's impulse for this to be like a choral book I also intuited, and I remember telling you this, Miranda, I think this odd, like troubled, very strange woman um, has space to be even more strange or, and for you to just inhabit her strangeness even more because she's really thrilling. Um, so when we well, talk I about- credit you, I credit you with that because I mean, I wouldn't have, I think, I hope I would have eventually gotten there, but you were the one who kind of did that great thing that writer friends do for each other where you were like, let's cut to the chase. <laughs> this is the best person in the book you have to write her and like this other stuff is fine but like this is better than anything else in the book so like just and of course the reaction can be like but I've written a hundred pages right and you were like yeah you wrote a hundred pages to get us to this person so like now write about her and that was so such a gift oh I you know it was a beautiful thing you gave me hey but Go ahead. No, you, you, you. <laughs> no, Leslie, do it. Leslie, say something. No, I was just going to get like meta for a sec, of course, and say that I feel like part of what I love about um, listening to you and Emily talk about being writing partners and that part of the process, I also just want to back up for a second and say um, congratulations and happy pub day. And I'm so thrilled to be here. And I love that you talked about eating lentil soup together. And I love that like people in the chat are just ran with it. There's a lot of talk about lentil soup. And I actually feel like that's one of, but certainly not your only superpower is like gathering people and nourishing them and nourishing conversations. So it's thrilling to be a part of that here tonight. And, you know, I was thinking like, about the connections between caregiving and power and caregiving as a kind of power and also how maybe often, because I do think that caregiving and power have deep affiliations and connections. I also think it's like one of our go-to impulses when we think about gendering power is to think about female power in terms of Absolutely. caregiving. I would love to hear other people talk about both the connections that are there and also what it means for that to be a kind of default. But what the way I wanted to get meta was just like listening to you and Emily talk about um, being writing partners, one of the things, and, and totally, I also have those versions, like those deep relationships that have lasted for many years that permit a kind of honesty that feels born of like love and knowledge and but can get like to the point um, efficiently, like through that long-term long love and knowledge. And I was thinking about like how people or selves, one of the things I, I love about this novel is that it understands that like people are selves in ecosystems and like communities rather than just like having a self and this is yourself and mm. this is your identity. It's like yourself is almost more like a microbial biome or something that's like part composed of like the other people who are your people or part composed of the people yeah. who had friction. And I'm just thinking about like Saskia and Issy, who's one of the other primary female characters and another great great character another really powerful character in this novel like their friendship um it's like they in their moments of interaction they bring things out of each other like I'm thinking about the ways that like if you can get honest with Saskia or sort of push her towards things or knows maybe what what she needs in a moment to be nudged towards action I was also thinking about female power as something that resides like not in an individual but maybe also in a like in a inside yeah. a friendship or a dynamic definitely definitely and that I thought so much about that in writing the book um both in the past and the present you know these these adult friendships I, it's interesting that you use that word biome because I thought a lot about biomes when I was writing this book because it's so much about the natural world and decay and sourdough and fungus you know I really thought about all of those and female bodies and this really in this really deep way um, and those adult friendships, how they then are kind of uh, replicated when we see those children grow up and we see them as about the same age that their parents were um, when they were living in this really intense way <laughs> on this commune. Um, and uh, I don't know, I just like, I loved thinking about, uh, I thought a lot about when you're a child, how the parents are like the weather and 
Emily and I, I remember us talking about this early on that I really wanted the adults and the decisions they make when in the past part of the story, I wanted them to feel like weather that the kids were kind of navigating rainstorms and sunshine and snowstorms and um, you know, there's very, there's very real weather in the book, but but I think also a huge part of that is gender, <laughs> right? It's how these kids are playing out in gender. And, and I really thought, I, I would love to hear your thoughts about this because I think you all have something to say about this. But one of the things that I noticed for me, the arc of Saskia is like her breaking through the idea that in order to be a powerful female, she has to do it in opposition to a man. You know, up until that point, it's like, the women are powerful kind of in spite of Abraham or in conversation with him or, you know, because, or they have to be powerful by leaving him behind. But there's something that happens at the end of the book or that I want to have happen where you have the sense that she, she decides, I don't need to be powerful by interacting with masculinity. I can just be powerful. Um, I don't know. That's just an idea that I had when I was thinking about the shape, you know, when you kind of have those wonderful shapes that you're like, this will be the secret shape of the book that no one else will really know about. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really interesting to think about. Well, yeah, and I love, I mean, I love, I love that tension of thinking about like both the ways in which female power can sometimes be measured in, in acts of, or in terms of resistance to a male force. Like, and maybe it gets to something even, I'm just thinking out loud here, but it's sort of, what is it the definition of power? Like is power somehow always relational? Like does it always need to be exerted somehow against or towards another person? And like then in that moment, right. is, it, is, is there a way in which to call it female power? It's sort of, always happening somehow in relation to maleness or like male systems of power. Um, but I do love like, I, I, I think I also, some of what I love is just like some of the female, female relationships in this book and how they, I don't know, are there other kinds of, like maybe even a taxonomy of forms of power is interesting. Like power that, that like kind of exists as resistance or power that mm -hmm. exists as creation or power that exists as I don't know the, the generating of joy or power you know power that exists as like sustaining life like what I don't I don't I mean I'm curious to hear other people but just like what do we even mean when we talk about power and like how do those different forms of power kind of like and sexual and sexual yeah. power yeah magnetism yeah exactly yeah that's totally fascinating too well, yeah, cult, I mean, are cults mainly always like are men almost always leading cults with like sort of charismatic bullshit? You've been reading all these cult novels, Miranda, <laughs> so I wonder. I mean, I think it's yeah. I mean, I think that that I think that what's interesting to me about cults is that within this culture is that is that we have a problem with toxic masculinity, and so like it's so invisible to us that I think that even even co constructs that are like existing outside of that still replicate <laughs> that deeply set problem. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's still about somebody in charge, often a man who is telling people how to be, you know? Or to give up all their belongings or. Yeah. 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 It was so when I, while Saskia was so, so eager in the very beginning, she wanted to do all of it. She wanted to give up everything. She just wanted to be part of home. She just wanted to throw her life behind her. And then yeah. she more powerful, that changes. Right. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, my hope is that at some point she comes to realize, oh, I'm just a pawn. I thought I had power, but mm -hmm. being handed power by this man doesn't make me powerful. It just makes me like carrying out his will. At the same time, I think that one of the reasons why Abraham is such a seductive cult leader, particularly for women, and you know, like the mothers of these children when they're children, teenagers when they're teenagers, um, and the teenagers themselves, is that he's all about, as Marcy just gestured at, like giving up your belongings. He's a, his, his whole thing is about unthing, unthing yourself, and. Um, I think that actually for a lot of us during the like the height of the pandemic year, we, we, we were um, attuned to that concept of like, all right, uh, 
a recalibration of values. And so, uh, you know, I remember also working out this book with Miranda and talking about it and deciding, you know, he, he, he needs to be seductive in that, in that realistically his concept is, you know, at, at its heart really good, which is about, you know, being anti-commercial, anti-stuff, getting back to the land, being yeah. communal. Um, and then there's this line, right, that where he's also monstrous and, um, and I like, I like that in this book, we get to really um, understand why, why his power is seductive. Um, and I think there is a particular seduction for women um, into cults Definitely. that have a lot, that make a lot of sense. I have, I had a student who was in a cult for many years and was beaten by the cult leader and um, had, had a sexual relationship with him, but also, you know, got a lot out of, like was there for a reason, you know, and um, was writing her way through a memoir about it. And um, many of us watched and were really absorbed by the, what was that show, Miranda, the Wild West, the documentary about- Oh yeah, um, Wild Wild Country. Wild Wild, wild, wild Country. Country. I don't know if yeah. anyone in the audience watched that or any of the other panelists, but um, it's about- We a talked cult. about that so much about yeah. his stare, how he doesn't, he doesn't blink. Right, well, I was really so interested in his um, charisma that I, after watching that documentary series also just watched his speeches and was totally seduced by him. You know, he's like a major intellectual power and also <laughs> very screwed up. Well, and has, and has a woman, is, is, is his right hand person is a woman who's basically doing his bidding and is kind of the one who's destroyed, right? Like she's she's like the, the businesswoman. And then you see her at the end of the, I mean, this isn't too much of a spoiler, but you see her at the end of that series and she's like a shadow of her former self. And you think like, wow, she bore the brunt of this. She took it on. I mean, that idea was definitely interesting to me and, and really came through in that concept in the character of Gabby, Issy's mom who who is like there from the beginning and then she realizes oh shit like this is going way different from how I thought it was going to and is kind of the only sensible one who gets out you know and I love that I mean not to be like that person who now takes us to a Nexium place but I guess that is now my role <laughs> this particular microbial biome of this conversation but I mean I guess I was thinking about um the role that women the forms of power that women were sort of um I guess I want to say sold on or is one of the definitions of a cult but it sort of sells you disenfranchisement as empowerment in some way um I don't know I really want to hear I saw Nicole in the chat was like I want to hear more about your cult research Miranda <laughs> couldn't agree more could listen to you talk for the rest of the night about your cult research um but uh, yeah I guess I was thinking about the what Emily was saying too about like the ways in which um, any kind of involvement in a community, especially when it becomes or is in part toxic, is like it, it's it it's fascinating and reveals truths that are uncomfortable in part because it's not all bad. Like unthinking is actually I was I was really struck by unthinking even the power of that piece of language, right? Like I was like when Miranda could you know, has some latent cult leading potential just because there's something so, that word is actually really, it has a kind of energy to it, you know, and certainly those ideas of like, um, how, how can we sort of find a liberation in unthinging ourselves is an interesting idea. It's not just like, a, it's not just some sham that can be like dismissed as without meaning for the right. rest of us. And also think about Abraham as somebody who like part of his charisma comes from like, looking closely at people and seeing something in them that they feel has not been seen, which was one of the things that I was struck by in the next theme documentary, which is why I brought it up. But just that idea that like, yeah, how easy would it be to like throw all this away if we weren't all sitting here constantly wanting the world as embodied by particular people to see the things in us that we feel like nobody can fully recognize. Right, definitely. Should, you know, kind of holding definitely. truths. But I am curious, like what both what emerged for you in your cult research and how it ended up, how you sort of found a way to writing your own 
thing home it's creepy cult yeah. well, I, mean, I did so I grew up in proximity to people who, who grew up communally in in what might some of them be described kind of cultish experiences my husband grew up on a commune with someone you're close to Leslie and um I was struck we went to, to lunch kind of the seed of this book came from the fact that we went to lunch with somebody who um, was a little bit older than my husband and the other children who grew up in this commune. And they were like in middle school and then high school when they lived on this commune. And um, they were really messed up. And it's not as though my husband and the other children didn't have really challenging things that happened to them living in this place. But she was a whole level of upset about her experience there and the way it had like ruined her life that was very palpable. And I think my husband was really surprised by that. And she was like 12, 13, 14 during the time that they lived there. And that to me was kind of this, the first inkling that I wanted to write about. What would it be like to be, to buy in on a place like this at that age when you're already so passionate and so attuned to what's true and rejecting the values that you were raised in and finding your own your own identity right that the, to to think of an adult taking advantage of kids in that way in, in no excuse me in no way that's sexual but but using that the same virility that comes from uh i think what fuels that kind of sexual identity in that age um really harnessing it and that that i was really interested in so I thought a lot about that. I did some research, but I also, I really honestly chose to not go down every rabbit hole because at the end of the day, I wanted the book to be about people. And I can find that with my, and it's a novel. This is why I love, write, love, love writing novels. Mm -hmm. I know that two of you are really accomplished nonfiction writers. And I respect that so much because one of the things that I love about writing fiction is that at the end of the day, you can say, well, I made the choice to do this. With this character and so I did some research some basic research I read uh, at the recommendation of Emily this great book called The Sociopath Next Door um, which was incredibly helpful just thinking about how someone might manipulate a group of people to do their bidding um, and I read a couple other books um, and I watched some documentaries and then I just wrote it um, and I I did want to examine the idea of this unthinging because it's what will save us if anything will um and I believe in it but I also wanted to think well what if you could believe what if someone could tell you the truth and it would be told in a way that was so toxic that you couldn't actually live it um that was really it felt like a, a, a nerve I wanted to touch a lot of times um Oh, I'm loving this conversation. I'm loving everybody in the comments. I'm loving your beautiful faces. What else do we want to talk about? What else do we want to say? What else? What else? Um, I have a question for you, Miranda. Yes. I mean, I have a thousand questions for you and I see that there are already some um, coming from all the wonderful people who are gathered here. But um, I was, yeah, I guess I was thinking about how, um, you know, I mean, as you were just saying, part of, part of, you know, when I write, like, I guess there's always this tension between research and then letting the particular aliveness of the work itself, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, sort of not be somehow um, muffled under all that research, but animated by it instead. And I think character is one of the ways the kind of particular aliveness of characters is one of the ways that when it seems to be, when the work seems to be pushing back against the muffling, it does so <laughs> often through character. But I, I was just interested in thinking about the idea for this conversation in the first place. I was wondering how or if you thought about, I guess it's a two part question, probably like an eight part question, like my questions always <laughs> are, but like what, how you thought about different female characters in this book or different characters in general as manifesting different forms of power, whether that was one of the ways that you understood characters sort of taking shape as distinct entities. And I guess the second part of the question is like, how much do you come to character through those kind of like conceptual 
Oh, that's, yeah, I, I love that. Them through the weeds or through the sourdough or through the particulars of moments and conversation and the words they use. And Well, it's interesting that you ask that because Saskia is not a mother very purposely, but yet there's this feeling of mothers kind of shadowing this whole book. Um, like there's the mother sourdough starter and then there are all these different mothers who, um, who show up time and again and some of them show up in multiple time periods. Um, and Itsy becoming a mother is really problematic to Saskia. So I was really thinking about, I was thinking a lot about that change in a person. And we've all gone through it because we're all mothers. Um, that change in a person when you kind of, when you become this, this self that has another person you made, <laughs> whether that's biological or not. Um, and there's this one scene that I remember you talking to me about, Leslie, where uh, last summer, where um, Saskia's peeking in the window and she sees the adults in the past, these three women sitting around. She's like eavesdropping on them in the main lodge. And one of them, Sarah, is like, is the cook. So she's this very iconic figure who can always feed everyone and she can make a feast out of nothing, you know, a feast out of like a can of rotten beans. She can like create something incredible. And then there's Gabby, who's like the, the brains of the operation. And um, they're in the main lodge and they're gossiping because this man who was married to another of their friends is obviously having a breakdown. And then that woman comes into the lodge and they welcome, you know, I, I had this moment, it's always that fun thing when you're writing a scene and I thought, well, they, they, might, they might reject her in this moment, right? Like they're really pissed at how her husband's acting. But instead they welcome her in and she has her baby tied to her back who's asleep and they bring her in and they sit her down and they give her tea. And um, that was such an important scene for me because I think these women require each other. You know, they, they, they are gonna be there for each other no matter what happens. And you see that replicated in the present day when Saskia, um, Saskia's always had this problem with this, Issy, kind of Issy, and she triangulate with this third girl, Cornelia, who is very, honestly, probably the most like me <laughs> in in her expression. She's like a mom who just wants her kids to be okay, and she's very square in a lot of ways. Um, but they, but Issy sees something in Cornelia that Saskia doesn't, and then I wanted to give Cornelia her due. Like I wanted us to see that there's a reason that she's like that and that it's actually really wonderful that she's like that. It's not lame at all. You know, it's something to celebrate. She, she wants to be a mom. And that's like, she's found identity in that. And in many ways, that's her opposition to her mother. So all of these different ways, and her mother is like a hypersexual seductress who gets blamed for everything, right? And of course it's not Butterfly's fault. Um, but I did think a lot about those different tropes. And yet it's also that that game of like, but then how do you make sure that those people feel real and not like they're the cook? And and I think maybe the way to do that is to turn it on its head, right? Like Sarah stops cooking and it's really bad for everybody <laughs> um, when she makes that choice. So yeah, I and you know, I thought a lot about Emily, I thought a lot about, um, Searching for Zion, which is a book that we we worked on, I mean, a long time ago now, um, and in these intentional communities and the ways in which you talk about different women within those communities, like definitely I referenced those ideas, the ways in which women in these challenging circumstances kind of keep each other up, keep each other going. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for that because it, it really helped me a lot when I was thinking about this, this book. Um, all of your work helped me. I mean, I really, I read all of your work and all three of your works and, and, um, and, you know, Leslie, you just, you just published, I haven't been able to read all of it because it's been public, but this amazing essay about C-sections, um, which has been really fascinating to see people respond to and thinking about that role, the idea of the C-section in our culture and then also in a body. Thank you. <laughs> I'm excited to read more of it when I have more time. <laughs> Talk about biomes. I mean, thinking about works that's always existing in the kind of biome of responses and maybe the conversation is just as interesting 
somebody was like, you have like 550 comments. Do you read them? And I was like, no, because I'm <laughs> sure that whatever is happening in those comments is nothing I want to read. Um, <laughs> I mean, and I love you even, even describing that moment of um, not being sure how the two women were going to respond when that, when she walks in and that, that, that is part of the magic of how, I mean, not to be too mystical about it or whatever. I'm writing fiction for the first time in a long time again and thinking about how those moments of, how, how we can create characters and worlds in which like we are actually available for surprise. Like there's something happening in the things we have made. I mean, kids are kind of like this too. They surprise us from the very beginning in all kinds of ways and that their aliveness somehow exists in that surprise. But I guess it makes me wonder, like that's one moment where you sort of realized, oh no, they welcome her and offer her tea. And I guess I'd also love to hear about other moments, large or small, of when you were surprised by sort of the course the novel took or things characters did and how it sort of took shape for you in those moments of surprising you. That's a great question. I mean, so I, I usually work from an outline, but I write, I have an outline so I can, I can um, break it. <laughs> like, I, I feel like I have an outline so I know what highway would get me from A to B, and then I can like go on off roads to get from A to B. Um, so there's always this sense of like where I'm headed. The end really changed basically pretty late in the game because my editor read my version of the end and was like, this is too dark. <laughs> Like the, the book is already really dark and she's like, this is, this, we have to, we have to offer some redemption to, um, to these characters. We have to give them some, some love, which is also what she did when we worked on my novel, Bittersweet. So I basically can never publish a book without her because I think she, she requires redemption from my characters in a way that maybe I don't, I don't give them. Um, so that was definitely a surprise to me that it would work, it would work just as well to give this main character some some joy at the end of the book, just like the smallest measure of it. Um, I love that. I, I also want to talk about female joy as an idea, right? Like like Marcy in the red in the red car, there's just so much joy, female joy. It's yeah. also I want like I love, I think that's why people love that book so much, because it talks about something that you don't see written a lot of like kind of this like throwing caution to the wind embracing just pleasure yeah I mean sometimes I think when I write fiction I'm kind of writing the story that I want to read and I, I mean that book I mean I was going through a divorce and I wanted to write a book where it was like so clear that this character getting divorced was like the best thing that could ever happen to her <laughs> so it was like it was like such an easy book to write and I mean I love that. Love that. Yeah, I don't know. So I think, I mean, I, there's something about, like, I would love to talk about women being powerful, like, not even in relationship to, like, the toxic toxicity of men. Like, yeah. One, yeah. One thing I was saying, like, it's not even related to writing, but, like, all this year through the pandemic, I've been, like, watching all of your Instagram stories. And I just find them so inspirational. I'm not even kidding. Like, as a writer, like, Miranda's just so honest and just, like, we'll talk about the writing process and the money and the babysitting and, like, sitting in a library and doing work. And it's just been great for me. Like, I've really taken strength in watching you have such a hard year and coming through it. And that's really powerful. thank you yeah. it's been a very powerful powerfully strange year in my life oh my for those gosh. of you who don't know we left yeah. the new york in the middle of a pandemic our apartment of 20 years mm -hmm. and now we live in vermont for now and um i had no child care for the last 16 months with two children and i had to finish this book so it was i mean i will say that the other joyful part of this community is a community of of mother writers um, and also just women writers who aren't mothers, but I would say my, my, my largest community of writer friends are, are also mothers. And the, the kind of the, the all mothers this year suffered, but I think writer mothers had a particular level of just um, our kids kind of, our, our, our need to care for our kids moving into the space where our writing had once existed. And that being really, really challenging, both physically and also mentally um but the joy of that too and I think the joy of you know um triumphing for me felt like a very important part of this process to be like I mean you know I had a number of moments where it's like I can't do it and then I was like no I have to finish this book for nothing else to know that I have 
done it so I can look back on it and like know that I did this thing that was impossible. Um, I don't know what that says about me, but, <laughs> but you know, and, and also like that space, that Instagram space, I mean, it's so silly and it's just social media, but um, the community of people on there cheering me on has been really fabulous. And it's been really fun to just make, I've started making these fun reels and it's been really fun to make them with my family, to find something to do all of us with our collective joy and energy um, to make, to make, you know, to be excited about other people's books too. Um, that's been really important. Just looping back to what Leslie was saying about character and also the red car, which is a book I love and, and tying it together <laughs> with what you're just describing Miranda, which is your, the disruption to your life, you know, that the pandemic caused. Um, and for financial and public health reasons and maybe with making the decision to leave the city that you love for this other place. Um, as challenging as it was, like, I think, you know, char character emerges when, when there's a disruption that happens and we're writing fiction, but also in life, you know, in, in the red car, there's this character who's, who's like having a hard time in a relationship and then gets this inheritance from a former employer. Is that right? I'm, I'm remembering, right? Like a woman she worked with who, with whom she wasn't even terribly close, like leaves her this <laughs> red sports, this red sports car. Like imagine this falling into your lap and you're not somebody who would ever buy a red sports car, just as like Miranda, you know, two years ago was never somebody who would imagine leaving New York, right? But then, but then a global pandemic, right? Like it's a, and just as um, is the case with there's and fierce little thing, it's like there's a big disruption that causes these kids to have to come together again, which is a threat, right? Which is that something from their past is threatening to be revealed and so they have come together to decide how to handle it and so Saskia the main character who's this hermit who would prefer to stay in her house is practically like dragged out and forced into unusual circumstances where where her character is tested and I think um you know when, when we're writing fiction we we put the volume on this thing that happens to us in life, like divorce or chart bearing <laughs> giving birth to children, we're losing a job, having a global pandemic your reality, which is like, okay, who am I with these new set of circumstances? Like, how am I going to adjust my, my patterns to um, continue to thrive and help and also, I thrive? And sometimes, yeah. And sometimes and those are like radically unexpected um, things that, 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 that make the test our metal um, or, or show us for being assholes or, or both, you know, like, um, right. That question, so. yeah, and that central question of like, what is my essential self? If like I'm stripped from all the things that I knew identified me, right? And I, we, all three of us have talked about this over the course of the year in various ways and emails and DMs and in person, like what, what is the part of me that exists regardless of all other things happening? <laughs> um, and, and I think this period of time for any of us has defined that and it's certainly I mean that's what was so weird about writing this book finishing this book during this time because Saskia was having to do that and I was doing it and also there were other parts of it, it was like I couldn't get bread or yeast for three months so I was using my sourdough starter to make bread for my family every day which is what my character was obsessed with and had been obsessed with for two years before that it wasn't as though that was something that I wrote because I you know I wanted because I had had experience in this pandemic doing it. It was just like, oh, suddenly I was having to feed my family with this bread I was making, which we're all eating now with really delicious hand churned butter melting on top of it. <laughs> delicious, delicious. <laughs> hi, hi, Caitlin, you're back. Hi, <laughs> okay, hi, sorry, I was muted. Hi. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we've got some questions though. Also, um, I want to come visit you in Vermont and have some hand turned. Come butter. visit. Bread. Um, Everybody come so, visit, please. No. Um, okay, so I've got a couple of questions and um, the chat has been super active, which is wonderful, but it is hard for me to catch your questions. So um, if y'all have one, put them in the, in the Q and A. Um, otherwise I'll, I'm probably gonna miss it. Um, okay, so I think this is one that maybe everyone could weigh in if they'd like to. Um, without spoilers, preferably, because not everybody's read the book yet. 
Um, an anonymous attendee asks, um, could you talk about how the female characters in Fierce Little Thing both enable, engage with, and ultimately destroy the toxic mascul masculinity around them via the character of Abraham? Oh, that's a good question. I know. I mean, so I think we should open that up to everyone talking about their work um, yeah. or ways in which the characters that are or stories that they've written that feel that way. I mean, I think for Saskia, she, as I said a little bit before, you know, she's she thinks that she has power because he gives it to her. And then it's only many years later that she realizes that the power that he gave to her is actually false and that she can only be powerful if he's not, if he's not pulling those strings anymore. Um, and that's a really scary thing to do because she, even though she's gone 20 years without hearing from him, he's still in her head, right? Which is something that Issy says to her um, early on in the present day. She's like, he's still in there. You just don't think he's in there, but he's, he's in there. And we all have that, I think, to some degree with somebody in our head who, who has said something to us about who we are. Um, but I definitely thought a lot about that when I was writing. Does anybody else want to answer that question about a book of yours or a project of yours or my book or each other's books, perchance? Or just walking through the world, even. <laughs> or no just going through the world. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's true, though. I love what you said, Marcy, about writing the red car as like a, a wish fulfillment of a moment in your life where you were feeling, had made, were going through this thing and what you wanted it to be. I think that's just such a, I mean, talking about joy, that's such a joyful choice. And that that made it easy to write it. Yeah, it did. Yeah, that book was... <laughs> that book was helpful to me and then later when I had that book in galley form I was reading it and I was like this writer she really gets me and it was the funniest thing because I'm like then I had to remember that I actually wrote it because it was reading like a book but I think I think that's why we write is to sort of get the things out that are in our head that we can't really process and then we put it down on paper and I don't know one time someone pointed out about my writing is that there weren't very many male characters in it at all and I was like oh why and I'm like I guess that doesn't interest me <laughs> I don't know <laughs> So I put, I put some men in, in very nice, but it's kind of, I don't know. So I mean, I guess I wonder if like, I think how much power we can give to men sometimes if we could just, just not listen to them at all. Um. <laughs> Definitely. I I'm That's talking great. Too much. I'd love to hear what Emily or Leslie have to say. Yeah. And I can, I can also reread the, the question again. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a heady one. It was a great, but um, just kind of a uh, female characters and fierce little thing or in, in your writing in general, um, how they enable, engage with, and or ultimately destroy um, toxic masculinity around them. Um, if you wanna talk about fierce little thing, they're particularly interested in Abraham, but again, tiptoe, because we don't wanna spoil <laughs> it too much, yeah. It's good vengeance, guys, you're gonna like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty, it's, it's good vengeance. I got a lot of my aggression out. I had I had something happen before before the pandemic where I was on the subway and I was reading out loud to my son and this just asshole was like really angry at me for reading. I wasn't even reading out loud. I was like sitting next to my child reading to them. And he like, this white man, of course, um, was like, really, you're gonna read out loud? And I had this moment where I was like, oh, I should apologize. And then I was like, no. I am doing nothing wrong. In fact, I am magnificent. And I just like unleashed all my fury on this poor sniveling little man. And then I got everyone on the subway car to like unleash on him. And it was just, it was so satisfying. The rage that I gave to this jerk who didn't even deserve my attention, but it was so great. I can still feel like the power of it. <laughs> I love that. And I, it is like such a practice to kind of kind of like when, you know, you're confronted with that and your, your instinct is just to be like, Oh, Oh no. And then you have to kind of just take a beat and, and, you know, realize that, um, wait a minute, I'm just humaning existing. And then anyway, um, bravo to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Well, gonna say, Les Leslie was going to say something. I want to hear. Oh yes, you. please. Oh no, I was just going to say, it's really connected. To, I mean, first of all, I wish I had been, um, on that <laughs> subway car. <laughs> I hate when people read to their children on the subway. 
<laughs> um, I also love that Quinn got to see you say, yeah, no, actually it's fine that I'm reading to my son on the subway. And, you know, I was connecting it too to what you'd said earlier about not being sure what those women were gonna do in the moment and then realizing that what they did was greet this other woman or what Emily was saying earlier about um, moments of disruption and just thinking it and how character sort of emerges through or in those moments and just thinking about how that process that we've been talking about some in relation to craft and fictional characters of like, oh, I thought I knew the contours of this character, but in this moment I'm discovering them those contours right. more fully through what they do and how that happens can happen. We like meet new parts of our sel selves in those moments. Absolutely. Where, and it's so much of the time it is around apology, right? Where we can sort of like notice that impulse to apologize, do the thing that will make the other person feel comfortable and almost thrilling. I remember one time a guy dumped me and was like, can I give you a hug? And I was like, no. <laughs> that was just like, oh my God. Cause every part of me we had been training, trained and training myself for years to say, sure, yeah, give me a hug. Will that make you feel better about this moment of pain that you've caused me? Great, like, let me offer my body to facilitate that process. And just right. have to be kind of interesting to be like, oh, who's that, Where? what's that little voice inside that just said no? Like, who is that yeah. little voice, like, you know? And just this kind of that discovery as, yeah, I, 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 I know exactly what you mean. And I think, I mean, I think this year has really taught us a lot. And I remember another time on the subway, I was writing and a man exposed himself to me and I had never had that happen to me before. And my reaction was just to be like, that man is showing me his penis. It's disgusting. I don't want to see his penis. And like, first of all, people on the subway were like, what is this woman saying? And then they all saw that that's what he was doing. And then they all just like turned on him. And I was like, I didn't know that I would do that. Like I had no idea, it just happened. I didn't know that I was going to be the person who was going to say that and point to him and shame him. And then I was kind of like walked off the subway and I was like, and this was like before you would have even known to, to report that as a sexual assault. Like I didn't have the language to know that that's what had happened to me. Um, but it was so magnificent to just like tell the truth about what he was doing. So like, I encourage everybody who's listening to do that sometime when when some man is being horrible to you just like call it by what it is and see what happens it's pretty great if you feel safe obviously <laughs> yeah absolutely and I feel like I mean I don't know like a, you kind of like move through the world and you want to kind of practice your like you know your empathy muscles and, and that's important but um I've never really thought to kind of like give my um empowerment muscles a workout too. Um, <laughs> Definitely. So uh, you've uh, inspired me to kind of be more mindful about that. And because, um, you know, whatever really intersection good. you're you're in. Um, but I, I love that. And uh, Leslie said, we got to all ride the subway with you, which um, <laughs> sounds great. I, apparently I act crazy on the subway. I don't know. Oh, no, you're just going to be like my like little. It's a liminal space. It's a liminal space where of... like anything goes, I guess. Yeah, walking <laughs> off the square. Um, I'm just gonna imagine like you with me and like, what would Miranda <laughs> do? Um, this, okay, so we've got <laughs> we've got another question. And then I have one, if y'all will indulge me. Uh, we are running out of town. If anybody else has questions, now's the time. But um, I understand if you don't, because this has been such a well-rounded and um, wonderful conversation. Okay, and we've kind of touched on this already. So if you'd like to, you know, pass that's fine um but an I mean, I'd like to know um can you talk um about how your own experience of living in international communities or various exposures to commune living influenced your writing of the book which seems specific to you but if anyone would like to chime in that is welcome well i think i mean you know this year has been a, a year of of in, unintentional communal living um and i uh, lived for a while with a single mom and her daughter with my family so that we could get work done because the logistics of our life meant that there was no way that all of us could get our work done and we all had to so we lived together and now um, I live very close to my sister and her family but for time we actually lived with them in a small cabin um, my sister mm -hmm. and her husband and their two children and then my family of four and sometimes my parents as well um, and it was amazing to live like that when I was writing a book about living communally because the logistics of feeding people is so hard and exhausting. And I used to be really intimidated by making 
a meal for 10 people and now I can do it like nothing like now you, I can be like we got some cheese we got some rice yeah sure it's fine we can do it anybody else want to come over like uh the skill to do that and I love I loved writing Fierce Little Thing before I knew about that skill. I, I felt like I had to do all this thinking about like, how would Sarah feed all these people and what are they growing and where are the cans, like what canned foods are they cooking? And now I feel like if I had to feed 40 people like she is, I could probably figure it out in like a week. It'd be hard, but I'd make it work, you know? Yeah. Um, but like those practical questions, like how do you feed a lot of people? Uh, was something I had, to, in some ways, something I had to do more research on than like, what it is to live on a commune or be in a cult you know um like how do you do that yeah when do you but when do you bake the bread all that stuff right but like the not sexy parts being in a cult. The not sexy part yeah oh uh, okay so um we have one uh, other question from our attendees uh autumn asks miranda uh what inspired you to use the proper scientific names for plants and animals in this book well so saskia undergoes this change when she first gets to home She's a city kid and she's entranced by the natural world, but she has none of the language to describe it. And so she's like, there's a, an animal and it's small and furry and it's running across the ground. Um, and then this woman who I love named Marta, who's this older woman who lives in proximity to home, but is not a homesteader, which is what they call themselves. Um, she basically takes Saskia under her wing and gives her, she um, makes her study and she makes her memorize. And so Saskia becomes um, really skilled in the taxonomy of that place. She knows what the names of all the plants and animals are, their scientific names, um, and she knows what they're used for. And uh, this is both a burden and a gift. Um, and so the development of that muscle was one that, um, it wasn't right there at the beginning of the book, but it definitely came on properly in like the second draft where I realized I need to show this character's development. And one of the ways to do that is to really let her start to gain that conversation and language. Um, and those words, those names, those scientific names are so beautiful. Um, I haven't listened to my audiobook yet and I'm really curious what, how, I kind of was thinking about my poor audiobook narrator and I was like, I hope she's okay. Like <laughs> there's a lot of really tricky um, scientific names, but uh that choice was very much a character choice to kind of show how she is becomes inextricably tied to that place and I think this is an interesting thing that happens is once you can identify a bird call or know what a certain kind of mushroom is you you don't unknow it right it it it's like it's an, a part of your brain that you keep um so she takes this place that she grew up with her everywhere she goes and it never goes away it moves um, in so I, I'm sorry, this was a, a little bit rude, but it's exciting. Did you know that the narrator, um, her name is Saskia? Saskia, I know. It's weird, isn't it? Not um, intentionally. I, I was basically, they, they, they gave me a few people to choose from and I didn't know her name and I chose her. And then they were like, her name is Saskia. I was like, oh. It's witchy, I love it. Um, <laughs> Witchy power. Yeah. Um, so I put a link to the the audiobook as well from our friends at Libro.fm, which is um, Indie Bookstore's answer to uh, Audible, which is owned by the uh, evil empire that's bouncing around yeah. in space. Well, we're just want to kind of sell books, talk about literature. Um, okay, so I have one last question, if y'all could indulge me. I, I know we're running a little late, um, and this is a little bit goofy, but um, we kind of had uh, this week an accidental like ladies week at the bookstore. Um, all of our events are um, about books featured are, are, are books written by women and almost all of the conversation partners are, are also women. And um, and you have talked about kind of like being in writing groups and kind of corresponding through this whole time. And at um, our event last night, um, they had a similar kind of um, relationship and it made me realize that and I'm sure it's not exclusive to women um the the kind of communal part in, in writing that um booksellers like I, I never know that part of the writing process that y'all are all kind of in cahoots and cheering each other <laughs> on and helping each other out but um I've never heard um a, a male author kind of talk about that part of the writing process and um this isn't really a question it's more of like a, a comment I guess but um y'all find that to be the same and it, I mean it seems like kind of a natural um thing if you if you've got 
writer lady friends why wouldn't you yeah it's, I, I, it's one of the best parts of having writer lady friends because <laughs> you can kind of slip in and out of like talking about how challenging it is to potty train and then you also get to have this other highfalutin part of your life your friendship where you're also talking about like character development <laughs> which I think is a lot more interesting than only talking about one or the other you know I mean I I adore all of these women's children right I'm the godparent to one of them you know I I have this way in which we're fiercely connected but we also have these wonderful conversations where we talk about our our minds um and I would I mean I can't imagine one without the other truthfully and I'm so grateful <laughs> to amen all of you that guys. amen to both of that yeah, that's both those like, channels <laughs> what a great place to beautiful note to to end on and um but before we all like kind of pop off and grab dinner or uh, whatever um you're doing later this evening everybody um do you want to remind you all that um, we've got this wonderful book for sale at Square Books. I've dropped the um, link to purchase it in a lot. I wasn't subtle about it. Um, and I would like to remind all of those joining us that, and this is true for all new bookstores, not just Square Books, but um, we can't have these events, virtual, in-person, hybrid, whatever else is kind of coming down the pike um, without your support. So um, if you don't already have the book and you'd like to buy it, um, I would love to sell it to you. You can order it and, online, in person. And these also the amazing, time. all these other amazing women have yes, an incredible book Please do too. that and too. Um, if you haven't yeah. read any of their books, you must. They're all wonderful and they write, they write so beautifully, all three of them. I mean, they're not just great thinkers and minds, but they're amazing stylists in their prose and that's such a gift. So I love, I, I hope that if you haven't read any of them, you discovered one of them, you've discovered somebody new tonight to support. Yes, absolutely. I put links to, um, I think to everyone's books in there, at least one of them. Uh, if not, um, shoot me an email. I'll get you this book. Happy to ship it. Do it all day, every day when I'm not running <laughs> these wonderful events. Um, and thank you all for, for taking time out of your, your busy schedule, writing and mothering. Human and I'm going to be personalizing book plates too. So I can also like, you know, I am happy to sign book plates, but if you want to let Caitlin know a specific, um, you know, yes, inscription you'd like me to write, please do. I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Um, on our website, you can leave that in the order comments. Uh, I'll also put kind of our general email Amazing. address. I check that too. However you want to get in touch is uh, a-okay with me. Um, and this has been um, such a thrill. Um, I was just giddy about this all day. Um, and I just so, um, I feel so lucky to get to kind of eavesdrop and um, listen to y'all talk about this. Um, it's my favorite part of the job and you make it so easy. Um, it's just, it's gonna be fun to hand sell. And um, I'm rambling, I just feel grateful. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks for all of you go and, and congratulations again Miranda fantastic job yeah. and, and Marcy Leslie and Emily for joining us I hope to welcome you all yes. to Oxford Mississippi when the world is a little more normal uh same to our attendees who've never visited we'd love to see you got a nice balcony Thank you. um but in the meantime please take care and Miranda we wish you the best of everything for the rest of your book tour and, Thank um, you so much. Thank you to all of you. Yeah. Everybody. Great. Right. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.